If you are new to my channel, I encourage you to check out my extensive coverage on Stephen Kosher's case. Stephen has been missing since 2009. Foul play is clearly involved, but law enforcement are still viewing his disappearance as a walk away. I have recently added chapter numbers to the Stephen Kosher case update videos to make it easier for viewers to follow along in chronological order. Additionally, I want to encourage you to check out my extensive coverage on Terry Beaver's case. I've spent thousands of hours going through the SWFA and Creekside surveillance footage frame by frame, and I've made many new discoveries about her killer that you won't find anywhere else. Click on my playlist tab to view those videos in chronological order. If you have a case suggestion, please leave a comment below or email me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com. I review all case suggestions I receive. One major resource that I relied upon in making this video is the website www.whokilledlizbarraza.com. On this website, there is a great deal of information about Liz and her case. Just a few side notes. When I say Liz's killer throughout this video, I'm referring to the coward who shot Liz, but please keep in mind that there are at least two cowards involved in Liz's murder. This fact has been confirmed by law enforcement, and I will be providing evidence to back this up in this video. Additionally, in this video, I refer to Liz's shooter as a man. I do this because the coward who shot Liz is a man. For those who disagree, Stick around, because I will be providing evidence to back up my claim in this video. In this detailed analysis, I will be showing you still images extracted from surveillance footage. The surveillance footage that has been released or leaked thus far on Liz's case is of poor quality, and it was early morning when this footage was recorded, making it more difficult to see details. On top of this, when still images are uploaded to YouTube, there is a loss of quality. If you are a reporter, podcaster, or YouTuber who wants a copy of any of the still images seen in this video, you can request them by emailing me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com. This is the longest video I've created on this channel to date. Because of the length of this video, I've created chapters to give viewers stopping and starting points. Prior to uploading this video, I sent multiple still frames, a detailed breakdown, and a link to a private YouTube video to the Harris County Sheriff's Office. Alright, so let's get into this detailed analysis of the Elizabeth Barraza murder case. On the evening of January 24, 2019, Liz Barraza and her husband of nearly five years, Sergio Barraza, began preparing for a garage sale that they planned to hold on Friday, January 25th and Saturday, January 26th at their home located at 8623 Cedar Walk Drive in Tomball, Texas. Liz and Sergio did not post online or in the newspaper that they were having this garage sale. By all accounts, this was an impromptu garage sale that only Liz, Sergio, and some members of their immediate family knew about. In preparation for this garage sale, Liz called off work Friday, January 25th. The purpose of this garage sale was to make a little extra money 
for the couple to spend on their five-year wedding anniversary trip to Florida that was coming up in a few days. Later in the evening on January 24th, Liz and Sergio placed garage sale signs throughout the neighborhood, announcing that the garage sale would be taking place on Friday and Saturday. In the early morning hours of January 25th, at around 2 a.m., a black Nissan Frontier was seen on a neighbor's surveillance camera driving around the Barraza's neighborhood. At 6.08 a.m. on the morning of January 25th, Liz left her house and drives three minutes to the nearby Starbucks to get a drink. At 6.16 a.m., Liz returns home where she is captured on the Barraza's Nest doorbell camera. A minute later at 6.17 a.m., Liz and Sergio begin arranging the items for the garage sale on their driveway. They continue to set up the items together for approximately 30 minutes. At approximately 6.48 a.m., the black Nissan Frontier pulls into Princeton Place Drive from Kuykendall Road. The driver takes a right into the Goddard School parking lot. The Nissan Frontier is seen in the parking lot for 10 seconds and then exits the parking lot. Also at 6.48 a.m., Sergio leaves their home to go to work driving a white panel van. At 6.51 a.m., three minutes after Sergio left to go to work, the black Nissan Frontier is seen on surveillance camera in the neighborhood driving towards the Barraza's house. At 6.52 a.m., the Nissan Frontier passes the Barraza's home, where Liz is in the process of setting up the garage sale in the driveway. The driver makes a three-point turn on Cedar Walk Drive, parking behind Liz's car. The driver keeps the truck running with the headlights on, exits the truck on the driver's side, and walks towards the Barraza's driveway. There is a brief conversation between Liz and the driver of the truck as he approaches her. As the driver closes in on Liz, he pulls out a revolver, aiming it at her. The man makes one final statement and then fires three shots. After Liz collapses onto the driveway, Liz's killer then stands over her and fires one more shot. At 6.53 a.m., Liz's murderer sprints back to the truck and drives east on Cedar Walk Drive and then east on Princeton Place Drive towards Kuykendall Road. At approximately 6.54 a.m., after hearing four gunshots and observing the Nissan Frontier drive away, the neighbor across the street from the Barrazas dials 911. Also at approximately 6.54 a.m., Liz's killer exits Princeton Place onto Kuykendall Road, makes a U-turn, and heads back towards the crime scene. At 6.55 a.m., Liz's killer drives by the Barraza's house again, heading west on Cedar Walk Drive. Four minutes later, at around 6.59 a.m., Harris County Precinct 4 constables arrive to investigate and secure the crime scene. So where did Liz's killer go after driving back by the crime scene and proceeding west on Cedar Walk Drive? A gentleman by the name of Alex Lewis, also known as Welsh Chappie, discovered a YouTube video of Liz's killer driving the black Nissan Frontier by a house in Liz's neighborhood immediately after he drove back by the crime scene. Here is that footage.
This camera is located at 24535 Sandusky Drive, which is where the yellow star is at on this Google Map image. It's at this intersection of Sandusky Drive and Brogan Court, where this footage was captured. This means that after Liz's killer drove back by the crime scene, he took a left onto Sandusky Drive and went all the way south, passing Brogan Court and continuing further south on Sandusky Drive, out of camera view. It would have taken Liz's killer approximately two to three minutes to travel to this location after driving by the Barraza's home again at 6.55 a.m. This means it was around 6.57 to 6.58 a.m. when this footage was captured. Liz's killer continued driving south on Sandusky Drive, out of camera view. If you continue going south on Sandusky Drive, after passing Brogan Court, you come to a dead end in a cul-de-sac. This leaves only three possibilities. Option number one, Liz's killer lived or had access to one of these homes in this area, pulled the truck into a garage and closed the door before being seen. Option number two, Liz's killer went off-roading out of the cul-de-sac and took one of two exits. He either turned left, drove down this dirt path, and then jumped onto Kaikendal Road or he went right out of the cul-de-sac, passed over this ravine, took this narrow side path lined with trees, and proceeded onto Emerald Pool Falls Drive. From Emerald Pool Falls Drive, he could have taken side streets in this neighborhood until he got to Kaikendal Road. The reason I keep mentioning Kaikendal Road is because it is the main road in this area of Tombaugh, and is the only road in this area that will connect you to other major roads and freeways, if Liz's killer was trying to get out of that area as fast as possible, he would have had to have taken Kaikendal Road at some point. Option number three. Liz's killer got to this cul-de-sac at the end of Sandusky and realized in the heat of the moment he had missed his turn. So he made a U-turn, drove back north on Sandusky, turned right on Brogan Court, and took Brogan Court to Kaikendal Road. We can eliminate this option immediately because it's not possible. Alex Lewis got a hold of the homeowner on Sandusky Drive and spoke with him. The homeowner told Alex he reviewed all the footage for the morning of January 25, 2019, and after the killer drove by their house heading south on Sandusky Drive, the truck never returned. This means that only options number one or number two are still possible. We can also eliminate option number one, because on the Who Killed Liz Barraza website, it states, Later that morning, the truck is tracked on several commercial cameras, but is eventually lost in an area with no camera coverage. If Liz's killer had concealed the truck in a garage in this area, then there is no chance he would have been picked up on commercial cameras later that morning. This leaves only the second option. The driver must have exited out of the cul-de-sac and either turned left and taken this side path to Kaikendal Road, or turned right and taken this side path and side streets to Kaikendal Road. Knowing that the driver went off-roading after shooting Liz, his choice to use this 4x4 truck as a getaway vehicle makes much more sense. This 4x4 truck could easily traverse these off-road paths without getting stuck. It is a one-minute drive from 24535 Sandusky Drive to where Liz's killer exited the cul-de-sac. This means that at approximately 6.58 to 6.59, Liz's killer was out of that neighborhood and headed towards Kaikendal Road. This is around the same time that Harris County Sheriff's constables arrived at the crime scene. Once Liz's killer was on Kaikendal Road, he headed south, because if he headed north, he would be going back towards the crime scene where countless law enforcement officers were swarming at that point. Moreover, I can guarantee you that Liz's killer didn't go north on Kaikendal Road. 
because he didn't take the first right onto Smoke Lake Drive after he passed by the Barraza's house again, heading west on Cedar Walk. This is the fastest and most efficient way to get to Kaikendal Road after passing the Barraza's house heading west on Cedar Walk. Instead, he took the first left on Sandusky Drive and took that south all the way down to the cul-de-sac. One side note before I move on to the next chapter. Something that has me truly perplexed about Liz's killer going off-road out of this cul-de-sac is that a Harris County Precinct 4 Sheriff Constable lived in that very cul-de-sac. You can see his SUV parked there in 2021, and if you go all the way back to 2011, you can still see the Sheriff's vehicle parked there. Perhaps Liz's killers gambled that the Sheriff wouldn't be alerted in time, or perhaps they knew the Sheriff would not be home at that time. Alternatively, perhaps in planning this escape route, they overlooked this detail and just got lucky. Law enforcement have stated that the vehicle Liz's killer was driving is a black 2013 to 2018 Nissan Frontier Pro 4X. Note the yellow and white Pro 4X sticker that was on both sides of the rear of the truck. Another feature to point out is that the killer's Nissan Frontier does not have a roof rack, nor does it have the Pro 4X logo on the side that is sometimes seen on this model. The roof rack is removable, so it is possible that this rack was removed and then reattached after the murder to change the vehicle's appearance slightly. This truck appears to be in great cosmetic condition. I don't see any major signs of wear and tear, no dents or major scratches are visible. Additionally, there are no visible signs that this truck has been driven off-road recently as there is no mud on the side panels or tires. It is possible to rent Nissan Frontiers. Some have pointed out that this truck has fog lights, which aren't a standard feature on basic Nissan Frontiers. However, this is a Pro 4X model. Fog lights are a standard feature on the Pro 4X model. Law enforcement are certain the vehicle Liz's killer was driving was a Nissan Frontier Pro 4X. Some have speculated online that this might be a Nissan Titan Pro 4X because they look quite similar. One cosmetic feature that I noticed on the Titan that isn't on the Frontier is this V8 turbo label circled in yellow that is featured on the front door panels of Titans. This label is not visible on the killer's truck. As of the making of this video, law enforcement are still asking for the public's help in tracking down this black Nissan Frontier Pro 4X. There have been a few different YouTubers who have put out the Nest surveillance camera audio claiming that they cleaned up the audio and enhanced it. I'll leave it up to you to discover these videos on your own and let you decide if they are any good or not. The main problem I have with these videos is that they include recorded audio from the Nest camera prior to Liz's killer even pulling up to the house. This additional audio that they include is audio that is reportedly coming from a media device that Liz had playing while she was setting up the garage sale that morning. Liz, seeing a potential customer, turns down the volume on the media device when the Nissan truck pulls up and parks. To clear this matter up once and for all, I've taken the Nest camera audio and synchronized it with Liz's neighbor's CCTV camera footage so you can see precisely when Liz's killer pulls up and where in the Nest camera audio this conversation between Liz and her killer begins. I want to warn viewers that this video clip of Liz being shot is disturbing and may upset some viewers. Therefore, viewer discretion is advised. If you don't want to view this footage, skip ahead to the timestamp on screen now.
Let's watch that one more time. So this part that you are hearing right now is Liz's media advice. The conversation between Liz and her killer doesn't begin until shortly before Liz says good morning. And obviously the conversation ends when the first shot is fired. Based off the stopwatch, this conversation between Liz and her killer lasts about 18 seconds. So what was said during this 18 second conversation? The process I used to decipher this conversation is lengthy, and I won't bore you with the details. But I did start by amplifying the audio using a program called Audacity that is free to use. Perhaps in a future video I will discuss my process in more detail if viewers are interested. Long story short, I believe I have deciphered most of what is said between Liz and her killer that morning. Here is the amplified Nest camera audio synced with the neighbor's CCTV camera footage along with captions that state what I believe Liz and her killer are saying. I end the clip prior to Liz being shot. <laughs> Here it is one more time. Now let's walk through this 18 second conversation step by step. Liz's killer exits from the driver's side door, and Liz states, Good morning. I then hear a voice say something to Liz that ends in the words, Garage sale. What is stated prior to the words garage sale, I can't make out. But I do hear the words garage sale, and this statement is made in what sounds like a questioning tone. Here it is again. Liz then replies in a cheerful tone, Yup. As Liz's killer walks towards the driveway, he asks, You take a hundred for it? I believe he is asking about the Stormtrooper helmet, because it was displayed in front of all the other items at the very end of the driveway. Additionally, Liz's killer is looking down at the helmet as he enters the driveway. Liz replies to his offer, stating, Sure. Liz's killer keeps looking down at the Stormtrooper helmet until he gets beside it, at which point he looks up at Liz and walks towards her and states, You know what? He says this while pulling out the revolver, pointing it at Liz. He then finishes the sentence with, It's not worth it. There is a brief pause, and then Liz's killer states, and shoots her three times. During this brief pause, Liz's killer can be seen reaching out towards Liz with his left hand, and Liz in turn reaches out with her right hand. I'm going to play this reaching motion between Liz and the shooter repeatedly to accentuate this movement. Shortly after Liz was murdered, a close friend or family member of Sergio's went online and released details about the case that they weren't supposed to. I believe this person has since deleted their comments, but not before someone screen captured them. In one of their comments, they state that Liz was handed a note and that the contents of the note are not being released.
law enforcement have not released any details about the person who shot Liz Barraza. Incredibly, they are claiming that they don't even know if the person that shot Liz is male or female, even though we have the shooter's voice on the Nest camera audio. And clearly, this is not a woman's voice. I still see some people on social media claiming the shooter is or could be a female. I strongly disagree, but for the sake of objectivity, I uploaded the killer's voice into the Voice Gender app. This app uses artificial intelligence to determine the gender of a voice. For quality assurance, here is the portion of the Nest camera audio that I uploaded into the app. And here is the result. I'm including a link to the Voice Gender app website in the description below. The Voice Gender app analyzes the acoustic properties of a voice and has an accuracy of 89%. The following is surveillance footage officially released by Harris County Sheriff's Office shortly after Liz's murder in 2019. In this footage, the black Nissan Frontier is making a right turn off Gilbaugh Drive onto Oconee Drive. This cross street of Gilbaugh and Oconee Drive is just around the corner from the Barraza's home, about a minute away. Because the timestamp has been removed, we don't know for certain when this footage was captured. We do know that this footage was captured around the same time because the placement of the vehicles in the background and foreground are identical. Law enforcement have revealed that the Nissan Frontier was seen driving around the Barraza's neighborhood at around 2 a.m. on January 25th. So perhaps this footage that is darker may have been captured at that time. This footage appears to be captured sometime between dawn and sunrise because daylight is starting to break through the trees down the road behind the truck. Looking at an overhead view of Gilbaugh Drive, we can see it runs northwest to southeast. The truck is driving in a northwest direction, so the light we see coming through the trees behind the truck is emanating from the southeast. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west, so the first thing we can verify for certain is that it is early morning when this footage was captured. In addition to this, notice that there is frosting or condensation built up on this car's window in the foreground, which you typically see on vehicles in the early morning in Texas, not in the early evening. So what time in the early morning was this footage captured? Looking at suncalc.org, we can see that on January 25, 2019 in Tomball, Texas, Dawn was at 6.50 a.m., and sunrise was at 7.16 a.m. Therefore, because it is not sunrise yet, and appears to be around dawn, this footage was captured sometime between 6.45 a.m. to 7.15 a.m., give or take a few minutes. We know that Liz's killer parks on Cedar Walk behind Liz's car at 6.52 a.m. So if this footage was captured on January 25th, then we can narrow down the time frame of when this footage was captured to 6.45 a.m. to 6.51 a.m. at the latest, because it would have taken Liz's killer around a minute to arrive and park in front of Liz's house after making this right turn onto Oconee Drive. 
Looking back at the Who Killed Liz Barraza website timeline for the 25th, law enforcement state that the Nissan Frontier appears on camera again in the neighborhood at 6.51.40 a.m. and heads towards the Barraza's home. This falls into place with our estimated time frame for when this footage was captured. Therefore, if this footage was captured on January 25th, then the night footage was captured at around 2 a.m. and the morning footage was captured at around 6.51 a.m. Furthermore, this means that the morning footage is showing us the Nissan Frontier turning right onto Oconee Drive and heading toward the Barraza's house roughly a minute before Liz is murdered. The following are still frames I have extracted from the morning surveillance footage. I am including an oval guide and arrow to assist viewers. Notice how something, or someone, appears to be occupying the passenger seat, blocking out the light from coming through the passenger window. Unfortunately, the footage is of poor quality and is captured in the early morning hours when there is very little light, making it impossible to see the occupants with any clarity. After close analysis of this early morning footage, I believe there is a person seated in the passenger seat. Therefore, if this footage was captured on January 25th, then the shooter's accomplice was inside that Nissan Frontier when Liz was shot. Law enforcement have stated that they know at least two people are involved in Liz's murder. I believe they know this based off the surveillance footage. To further support my belief that the accomplice was inside that truck at the time of the murder, I'm going to play the Barraza's Nest doorbell camera footage, amplified and synced with the neighbor's surveillance footage once again. Here it is again. A few things to point out. I can absolutely hear the truck engine rev as the killer is exiting the driveway 
and running across the grass towards the truck. How can the truck engine rev if the shooter slash driver isn't inside the truck? Additionally, as the shooter enters the truck, I can hear him say something along the lines of keep pressing or keep pressing it. This is a demanding tone and the shooter is yelling this. Hearing the shooter's voice making this statement while he is getting into the truck signifies that he is probably talking to someone inside of the truck. So why would the shooter say, keep pressing? One thought that comes to mind is that this may be a manual transmission truck, and the accomplice was inside the truck pressing down on the clutch while revving the engine to make sure the engine didn't stall while idling. Perhaps one of my viewers has a working knowledge of vehicles and can speculate about why the shooter would have said, keep pressing. If this truck has a manual transmission, that would help narrow down the list of possible vehicles greatly because only 13% of vehicles sold in the U.S. have a manual transmission. If the shooter's accomplice was in that truck when Liz was shot, why didn't they just drive the truck? It certainly would have been more efficient and would have saved them valuable time to have the accomplice drive the truck. If this is a manual transmission vehicle, perhaps the accomplice didn't know how to drive a stick shift. Alternatively, the accomplice may have been too young or inexperienced at driving in general to take the wheel. One last thing to point out before I move on. Here is the voice saying garage sale multiple times. And here is the voice of the shooter. The voice saying garage sale sounds higher in pitch and doesn't sound like the shooter's voice at all. I believe it's probable that after the Nissan Frontier Park, the shooter's accomplice initiated the conversation with Liz by shouting from the passenger window. Liz turned down her media device and says good morning to the accomplice and not the shooter, who was exiting the driver's side door at that time. What are your thoughts on this? Leave a comment below. According to people that knew Liz personally, they have stated that Liz was around 5'2 in height. It has been speculated by many in online forums that the shooter is almost the same height as Liz. I don't fault people for believing this because at first glance, I can see where they're coming from. However, upon closer inspection, I don't believe Liz's killer is almost the same height as Liz. The Barraza's driveway has a slope to it and Liz is standing higher on the slope than her killer, giving her a boost in height. Furthermore, Liz's killer leans slightly forward towards Liz and rounds his shoulders as he closes in on her, making him appear shorter. The boots the killer was wearing appear to be light-colored calf-high boots. It's impossible to say what specific type of boots these are and how thick the sole is. The killer appears to be wearing a light-colored bathrobe, either cotton, silk, or some other fabric that is not rigid. This specific robe has two pockets on the front. Many have speculated that Liz's killer was wearing a Star Wars-themed outfit, perhaps a Princess Leia costume. It's certainly possible and can't be ruled out. I don't personally buy into this theory, primarily because none of the Star Wars themed outfits I have seen have pockets on the front, which this robe absolutely does have. I believe this robe and boots were chosen by the shooter to make him appear feminine on camera, keep blood from getting onto his clothes underneath, and it could be easily taken on and off. The following is the Barraza's Nest doorbell camera footage 
that was officially released by law enforcement in January of 2021. While there is nothing that viewers can see in this footage that is upsetting, the audio may upset some viewers, so viewer discretion is advised. At various points in the footage, Liz's killer steps partially into line of sight with the Nest doorbell camera, and in those brief moments, I was able to extract some still frames of him. Let's look at those now. I have circled his entire body head to toe. His head is located where the red arrow is pointing, and his boots are located where the blue arrow is pointing. These first still frames I'm showing you are of the shooter as he approaches Liz and begins to say, you know what, it's not worth it. For reference, at this point the shooter is standing approximately 28 feet from the Barraza's doorstep. No one in the public has ever produced any still images of the killer from the Nest doorbell camera footage. The reason being is that the footage is extremely difficult to work with, and the killer only steps into camera view for a few seconds. It took me multiple attempts over the span of several months to extract these images. In these images, the red arrow is pointing at the top of his head. It appears to me that he has darker hair, either dark brown or black. I boosted the highlights on this still frame to make his light-colored outfit stand out a bit more. Now we are getting into the still frames where the shooter's face becomes more visible as he moves closer to the Nest camera. These images are captured after he has shot Liz three times. For reference, at this point the shooter is standing approximately 19 feet from the Barraza's doorstep. I plan on posting some of these still images on my community page in the coming weeks, as well as my Patreon.
Liz's killer only uses his right hand to fire all four shots. In these still frames of Liz's killer standing over her firing the final shot, he keeps his left arm hanging down to his side, and he is holding something in his left hand that is visible due to it being darker colored, which contrasts against his light colored robe. After seeing this, I decided to look closer at Liz's killer's left hand in the Nest doorbell camera footage, and that's when I discovered what the object is. This object is visible in multiple frames. Here are those frames. The object Liz's killer is holding in his left hand is a rubber or silicone old bald man mask. When I went back and looked at the still frames of the Nissan Frontier driving by the Barraza's house prior to parking, the driver, aka the shooter, appears to be wearing this old bald man mask. I believe that as the shooter exited the Nissan Frontier, he removed this mask because he knew if he stayed out of line of sight with the Nest doorbell camera, his face would be concealed. In looking at the neighbor's CCTV footage, it appears to me that the shooter stuffed the mask into the front left pocket of his robe as he approached Liz. After handing Liz the note and shooting her three times, he then removed the mask from his pocket and has it in his left hand as he moves to stand over Liz and fire the final shot. This looks like a light skin tone, old bald man mask. You can buy these online or in costume stores from $30 to $600 or more, depending on how lifelike you want the mask to be. I believe both of Liz's killers had masks on to conceal their identities while driving around that area. The Barraza's neighborhood was surrounded by commercial properties that had multiple surveillance cameras. Additionally, several of Liz's neighbors had CCTV and surveillance cameras as well that the killers were aware of. The shooter's hair appears to be shoulder length. I'm leaning towards this being the shooter's real hair. One extremely popular theory is that Liz's killer was wearing a wig. If so, then this means Liz's killer was wearing the bald man mask while driving the truck, took off the mask when he parked, and he had the wig securely attached to his head underneath to keep it from coming off. This seems like a lot of extra work, but it's possible. He may have done this because he knew he would be seen on the neighbor's CCTV camera that morning, and he believed this wig in combination with the flowing bathrobe and calf high boots would make viewers of the CCTV footage believe he is a woman. Clearly this strategy worked to some degree, because even to this day, you will still find people who see the footage and believe the shooter is a female. Liz's killer may have also factored in that a neighbor 
or passerby might witness the shooting take place and would tell the police the shooter looked like a woman. The distance the shooter ran from Liz's body to the Nissan truck is around 50 feet, give or take a few feet. He ran this distance in approximately six seconds. This distance at that speed is not that difficult to do, even for someone who is not athletic. Now that being said, Liz's killer has a good stride and he maintains his balance while traversing concrete, wet grass, asphalt, and maneuvering around various objects. This is not easy, considering that he was wearing multiple layers of clothing, calf high boots, carrying a gun that weighs around a pound to a pound and a half. And he's also holding this mask and appears to be trying to put it on while running across the grass. Not easy to do. Based on his body type, which is thin to average, his speed, stride, and his overall dexterity, as well as the partial still images of his face, I believe the man who shot Liz is currently under 45 years old, possibly as young as 21. All right, so let's get into the new documents that have been uncovered on Liz's case by Alex Lewis, AKA Welsh Chappie, who I mentioned previously in this video. You can view most of these documents on his blog, Four Shots on Friday, The Senseless Murder of Liz Barraza. I'm including a link to his blog in the description below, so you can go there and check them out for yourself. I'm not going to go over every detail on these documents in this video, just the items I find most interesting. After reviewing these documents, if you think there is something important that I missed, leave a comment below or email me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com. Alex acquired these documents from a private detective named Kaylee Palmer, who acquired them via a Freedom of Information Act request. The first document is the Harris County Incident Report for Liz's case. The time of Liz's murder is listed here at 6.52 a.m. Below Sergio's name is a list of five other persons. Now these people are on this list not because they were involved in the crime, but rather because they were involved in giving law enforcement information and or evidence. I have blocked out their names to help protect their identities. I do know who these people are, and I'm not going to go into how they are involved individually, but these persons are primarily neighbors who supplied surveillance footage or witness testimony to law enforcement pertaining to Liz's murder. The document on screen now is a list of some of the businesses located near the Barraza's house that had surveillance cameras that law enforcement reached out to on the day of Liz's murder. Unfortunately, many of the businesses listed had cameras that were either not working or didn't face Kaikendall Road. But keep in mind, there are many more businesses in that area that had cameras that are not on this list one key camera location on this list is the Chevron gas station located at 24900 Kaikendall Road. According to this document, this camera is angled towards the intersection of Kaikendall Road and London Way, seen here on Google Street View. The yellow star on this map indicates the Barraza's home, and I've circled the location of this Chevron gas station at the intersection of Kaikendall Road and London Way. This camera should have captured Liz's killer as they arrived and pulled into Princeton Place at 6.48 a.m. if they came from the south. After pulling out of the Goddard School parking lot at 6.48 a.m., it's probable that Liz's killers headed south on Kaikendall Road, took a right on London Way, and then took another right onto Gilbaw Drive which is where we see them on camera at 6.51 a.m., turning right onto Oconee Drive, headed towards the Barraza's home. If this is the path they took, then the Chevron gas station camera should have captured them as they drove through the Kaikendall london Way intersection. This next document goes over some of the dispatch calls that took place shortly after Liz's murder. I'll just touch on the most notable events. 
At the bottom, it states, within two minutes of the shooting, a neighbor had called 911. It goes on to say that the neighbor gave a description of the vehicle as a black Nissan Frontier, headed eastbound on Cedar Walk. Incredible job by this neighbor calling 911 so fast and identifying the vehicle as a Nissan Frontier and not a Titan or some other make and model. At 7.05 a.m., a be on the lookout was placed for the black Nissan Frontier. This means that within 13 minutes of the shooting, law enforcement already had the bolo placed on the killer's vehicle. Earlier in this video, I calculated that Liz's killers would have been out of the Barraza's neighborhood by 6.59 a.m. at the latest. With that calculation in mind, Liz's killers should have been headed southbound on Kuykendall at around 7 a.m., no later than 7.01 a.m., depending on which exit they took. So even with this bolo being placed so quickly at 7.05 a.m., Liz's killers still had a four to five minute head start on law enforcement. Within that four to five minutes, there are several roads Liz's killers could have taken off Kuykendall Road South. A few of these roads are extremely rural, making it easy for Liz's killers to pull off the road and conceal the truck or take side roads to their destination, all while avoiding cameras. Now this is the portion of the dispatch log where there is some confusion. There is an entry at 7.10.08 a.m. that states, Black Nissan Southbound Kuykendall. If I'm reading this right, then this means that an officer located a black Nissan heading southbound on Kuykendall Road. However, it does not state what model this black Nissan is. Unfortunately, when these documents were released, law enforcement blacked out portions of this document adding to the confusion. The next entry at 7.10.42 a.m. states Kuykendall slash FM 2920 westbound. FM 2920 stands for Farm to Market Road, which is a road that runs east to west and intersects with Kuykendall Road. On this Google map, I have circled where Kuykendall and FM 2920 intersect and the star marks the location of the Barraza's home. This entry continues the narrative that a responding officer had located a black Nissan heading southbound on Kuykendall Road and that they were in pursuit of this vehicle as it turned westbound onto Farm to Market Road. The next entry at 7.11.05 states, hasn't initiated traffic stop yet. This entry makes it seem as though this responding officer was indeed behind a black Nissan and had not yet pulled them over. The next entry states 6225 FM 2920 on the south side of 2920. In this entry, the officer is giving the address where they pulled the black Nissan over, which is this location on screen now. After this entry, there is no more mention of the black Nissan in this log. In a separate document that was released, the VIN for this black Nissan that was pulled over has been blacked out, making it impossible to determine the model of the vehicle. It's probable that the officer saw a black Nissan and pulled it over, but it wasn't the right vehicle. I personally believe Liz's killers were long gone and nowhere even close to that address at 7.11 a.m. Liz's murder appears to be targeted, and her killers went to extraordinary measures to carry out this cowardly attack. The fact that the shooter planned this murder out so that he would be within arm's reach of Liz, revealing his face to her and staring into her eyes when he pulled the trigger, seems extremely personal. And yet, Sergio and Liz's family are all claiming that Liz didn't have any enemies. I'm sorry, but this simply is not the truth. Someone did, in fact, hate Liz. 
In this chapter, I'm going to explore and speculate on some possible suspects slash motives on Liz's case. And I'm going to rank them on a tier scale from top tier to bottom tier. I am aware that there are more complex arguments for each of these theories, but for the sake of time, I have narrowed my line of reasoning. As always, I look forward to hearing from you in the comments section below. But please remember to use true crime etiquette. And if you post something as fact in regards to Liz's case that isn't common knowledge, be prepared to provide a link to a reliable source to back up your claim, or that comment may be removed. Other than Sergio, this first suspect slash motive is the most talked about in online forums and on Facebook. Liz being a member in the 501st Legion organization has led many to speculate that Liz's killers were possibly members of the 501st Legion who were either jealous of Liz or got into a major disagreement with her or they were possibly kicked out because of her. Alternatively, it has been speculated that because Liz was on the command staff that maybe she denied her killers access to the group when they tried to join. In-group fighting, arguments, drama, these things happen anytime you get groups of people together. With that being said, in the over three years since Liz has been murdered, not a single member of the 501st Legion has come forward, and that includes Sergio as well. None of them have come forward stating that Liz ever got into any disagreements, any fights, any trouble with any of the other members. Additionally, it's important to understand that even though she was on the command staff, Liz couldn't deny or grant anyone access to the group. That's all handled via an online application form. I'm going to pull it up here, show you that. And furthermore, it states that new members' costumes are reviewed by a membership liaison, which to my understanding, Liz was not in that position. Based off the information that has been released thus far about Liz and her participation in this organization and, and just my general understanding of the organization, I, I, I just don't see any real possibility, but I can't rule it out entirely. So that's why I'm going to place this theory on the E tier. This next theory has also been talked about quite a bit in online forums and on Facebook. It kind of has a similar flavor to the 501st Legion. Liz worked as a data analyst at the Rosen Group located in Houston, Texas. It's a multi-billion dollar company. They specialize in inspection devices for pipelines and other complex technical systems. Some have speculated that Liz's killers may have been co-workers that got into trouble because Liz reported them to management or they were just jealous or angry because Liz outperformed them or she got a promotion over them. Alternatively, there is another theory. This one's hard to even mention without laughing. There's some that are speculating that Liz came across some file or some piece of information pertaining to the Rosen Group or one of their clients that she wasn't supposed to see, so she was taken out by a hitman to keep her quiet. From what I've gathered in my research on the Rosen Group, I don't get the idea that there was a competitive aspect to Liz's job whatsoever. Some of Liz's coworkers have posted comments in online forums and on Facebook, all generally saying the same thing. Liz didn't have any issues with coworkers or with managers and that she got along great with everyone. The theory that Liz stumbled across some secret document, it, it's just so silly to me. Like uh, like I said, it's, it's hard for me to even talk about it without cracking a smile. There's just no evidence to support this claim whatsoever. Overall, I believe this Rosen Group theory is even less likely than the 501st Legion theory. And that's why I'm placing it on the F tier. Prior to Liz working at the Rosen Group, Liz apparently worked at a place called the Cool Cat Party Warehouse, which is located in Spring, Texas. Now, I've also seen it stated online that Liz worked at this job as like a side hustle job, and she may have actually still been working there at the time of her murder, just part time. Her job duties and if she was still working there at the time of her murder has never been revealed to the public. On top of this, none of her coworkers have come forward. I've never seen 
seen anywhere in online forums or on Facebook where any of her co-workers at this Cool Cat warehouse said anything about her or the job itself. But um, some have theorized that Liz may have had problems with co-workers while she was working there and perhaps she got into a major argument or a disagreement with a customer who decided to seek revenge. I do find it interesting that Cool Cat sells a wide range of costumes, masks, including old bald man masks. They also have a wide range of wigs. I find this theory worth looking into. You know, I'm going to place this theory on the A tier at this point. The next theory is that of mistaken identity. Elizabeth Barraza is a somewhat common name. Perhaps her killers got her mixed up with someone else. This theory is tempting at first because everyone that knew Liz seems to be completely shocked that Liz was targeted for murder. But the fact that Liz's killers spent weeks, possibly months, planning out this murder and he got face to face with Liz. He looked her dead in the eyes and said, <laughs> and then shot her four times. I don't feel I even need to discuss this one, and I think most of you will be in agreement with me on this one. So I'm placing this on the F tier, alongside the Rosen Group theory. Some have speculated that Liz's murder may be due to a prior road rage incident. Typically with road rage incidents, we see the person who is enraged carry out the attack immediately at the point of contact with whoever has enraged them. They don't wait days, weeks, or months to seek out revenge. Additionally, we know at least two people are involved in Liz's murder, thus reducing the likelihood of this being a road rage incident. While I don't find this theory likely, we can't rule it out completely. So that's why I'm placing this theory on the E tier alongside the 501st theory. One theory that has been mentioned more and more frequently is that Liz's killers might have been neighbors of Liz and Sergio, and Liz had angered this neighbor at some point. It has been speculated that Liz may have called the police or the homeowners association on this neighbor for a loud noise complaint, noisy party, or some other reason, and the neighbor got in trouble. This may have been viewed as a minor incident to Liz and Sergio, but it may have had major ramifications for the neighbor. It appears that Liz's killers had knowledge of when the optimal time to strike Liz would be. This would have taken weeks of surveillance in that neighborhood to properly calculate when Liz would be alone outside the house. And yet, to my knowledge, not a single neighbor has come forward stating that they saw a suspicious person or a suspicious vehicle in that neighborhood in the weeks leading up to Liz's murder. I definitely think this theory should be investigated further, but I do find it strange that this angry neighbor would only target Liz and not Sergio as well. So that's why I'm placing this theory on the B tier. One theory that I've been kicking around lately is that Liz may have gotten to an argument with someone on social media. The Citizens Crime Commission of New York has a website where they compiled a long list of murders or attempted murders from 2014 to 2017 that were triggered by social media posts. I'll scroll through this list on their website for a bit here to show you that these events are not as uncommon as you might think. This goes on for several pages. I'll leave a link to this website in the description below so you can go check this out for yourself. Sergio and Liz's family are claiming that Liz had no enemies whatsoever. But if Liz got into an altercation with someone online, would they know about that? I believe this theory is more likely than the road rage theory. But considering that there are two people involved in Liz's murder, I'm a little bit skeptical. So that's why I'm placing this theory on the D tier. The last theory I'm going to talk about pertains to a person of interest in Miami, Florida. Not that long ago, law enforcement traveled to Miami 
to speak with a person of interest on Liz's case, but no further details have been revealed about this trip or the person that they spoke with. Prior to moving to Texas, Liz lived near Orlando, Florida. Could this person of interest be someone that Liz knew when she lived in Florida? This absolutely needs to be investigated further, and it looks like it already is. Because law enforcement seem interested, and this is the first and only time that we've heard the words person of interest on Liz's case, I'm placing this Miami theory on the S tier. Many of you are probably wondering why I didn't include Sergio. The primary reason is that until proven guilty in a court of law, Sergio is not only innocent of this crime, he is also a victim. I agree that there are some things about how this crime went down that point towards Sergio's involvement. But there are also a lot of things that point towards Sergio not being involved. Perhaps in another video, I can attempt to objectively break down some of the arguments for and against Sergio's involvement, if that's something most of you feel is appropriate and worthwhile. Leave your thoughts on this in the comments section below. Based off all the information and surveillance footage that has been released thus far, here is my profile of the shooter. The shooter is an adult male. I believe he is currently 21 to 45 years old. At the time of Liz's murder, he was thin to average build for his height. He is right-handed. The shooter or his accomplice had access to a revolver in January 2019. In January 2019, the shooter or his accomplice had access to a 2013 to 2018 black Nissan Frontier Pro 4X. Similar in appearance to the truck in the picture below. The truck did not have a roof rack in place at the time of the murder but it may have been attached later to alter the appearance. In January 2019, the shooter and or his accomplice had in their possession two rubber or silicone masks. One mask appears to be an old, light-skinned, bald man mask. Some examples of the type of mask he had are pictured below. There is currently a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for Elizabeth Barraza's murder. If you have a tip or any information, please call the Crime Stoppers of Houston tip line at 1-713-222-TIPS. All calls are completely anonymous. If you don't feel comfortable speaking with law enforcement, you can contact me at aaronstoner at yahoo.com and you can remain completely anonymous.